All right. Today is Tuesday, August 31st. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, it is the last trading day of the month. It is the last video from this channel in this month. So we should go out with a bang, right? Fireworks, giving away candy, or we're not going to do any of that. I'm going to celebrate the end of the month by giving you a tsunami of inflation data. And I know you're not interested in any of that. You're just interested in the tickers. Bro, just give me the ticker that's going to blast 30, 40% tomorrow and send me on my way. I got the tickers for you, but I also got a lot of information. So let's not waste any time here and let's go in focus tonight we're going to talk about this inflation crisis the inflation nightmare that is morphing right now as we speak into a stagflationary phenomenon of course we have the zombie leading the fed jerome powell who continues to say that we need to see what was it further or excuse me substantial further progress whatever the f that means well i'm going to share with you some data here and you tell me are we seeing enough substantial further progress or not in the morning we got the chicago pmi and the headline number was down the chicago business barometer fell to 66 point eight in august now the deflation crowd the transitory crowd the fed and their allies they look at this headline the chicago business barometer fell to 66.8 in august and they grab a giant jar of lotion and they start jerking off right away ah you see inflation is transitory but we know that the devil is always in the details if anything this is the greatest evidence we got so far for the stagflationary phenomena in the economy right now here are the details the chicago business barometer produced with mni fell to 66.8 in august the lowest reading since june after climbing to a two-month high in july order backlogs rose sharply while production sank Firms say the available supply of raw materials and workers isn't sufficient to keep up with new orders. Among the five main indicators, order backlogs saw the largest increase that was followed by supplier deliveries, while production saw the largest decline. This is perhaps the most important piece of data. Order backlogs climbed 11.6 points to 81.6, the highest reading since 1951. But Fed Chairman Jerome Powell says, hey, where is inflation? Is it over here? Is it over there? I don't see any inflation. And even if there is inflation, I got the tools, bro. Trust me, it's going to be transitory. Just put your blindfold on and continue to buy, buy, buy. And of course, this is the highest reading since 1951 because firms reported a shortage of materials, fried inconsistency, and insufficient staff. Supplier deliveries shot up 6.3 points to a three-month high of 92.8 with one survey respondent reporting the worst delivery times in three years and when participants in the survey were asked when do you expect the supply chain impact of covid19 to peak the majority 37.8 expected to peak in 2022 the second question was with enhanced unemployment benefits set to expire in september are you forecasting an increase in your staffing levels pay attention here the majority said were not they were not i maintain the position that the staffing shortage will not be resolved by ending the unemployment benefits and once we're past september my argument will be proven right because there are other reasons behind the labor shortage and i will share some of these reasons from the source of deflation china and you will be shocked but perhaps this is the second most important piece from the chicago pmi that we got today inventories rose 6.2 points to 48.8 the highest since march though still signaling contraction some firms reported stockpiling to get ahead of further supply chain disruptions while others said their inventories were dwindling because of logistic issues. Here is the second most important part of the survey. Prices paid increased 2.3 points to 93.9, heading the highest level since 1979 as companies continued to report higher costs for production materials. While the headline number is down, prompting the Fed 
and their allies, the transitory camp to jerk off, prices paid continue to increase to the highest level since 1979, the great stagflation of the 70s. But the Fed says, hey, where is inflation? Is it over here? Is it over there? I don't know any inflation. Is he a friend of yours? Because I never heard of inflation before. Demand for labor rose only slightly in August, with the, in with the employment index increasing 0 0.8 points to 48.3, as firms struggled to find qualified workers for available jobs. Production fell sharply in August, dropping 7.8 points to a two-month low of 61. New orders fell 4.4 points to 67.8, suggesting that demand is growing at a slower pace compared to July. So the demand is slowing down, but prices continue to rise higher. This is classic stagflation. This is the other shocking piece of data that we got in the morning. U.S. home prices once again jumped the most in more than 30 years. But I know, where is inflation? Wait, there is no inflation. It's going to be transitory, right? It's like a Snapchat story. Soaring home prices shattered another record in June. S&P Case Chiller says, home prices rose 18.6% annually in June, up from 16.8% increase in May. Prices are now 41% higher than the last peak during the housing boom in 2006. I repeat, prices are now 41% higher than their last peak during the housing boom in 2006. We're repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. But I know this time is different. This time we got the Fed. The sugar daddy's behind us. Wait till the sugar daddy fucks up. And then once again, you'll be left with your pants down. And this time around, the sugar daddy, the savior, will be nowhere to be found. This is what's different about this crisis. The sugar daddy is running out of ammo. These are insane numbers. Look at where the Fed inflation target is. 2%. Every single metro city in America. Every single one. Home prices are rising higher, way above the Fed's inflation target. Matter of fact, Phoenix up 30% year over year. San Diego, where I live, is the second hottest market in the United States right now. Prices are surging out of whack. Good luck finding rental homes here. Good luck finding homes to buy. Good luck even finding a box, an Amazon box to live in, in this city of San Diego. Homelessness all over the place. It's like the zombie apocalypse out there. And the housing boom, the housing mania, is spilling over into the rental market. And now the CPI for rent of shelter is rising significantly higher. Way out of whack. Growing year over year and month over month. Matter of fact, the cost of rentals is rising significantly higher. The highest levels that we have seen in decades, perhaps ever. We have the eviction crisis going on right now. And the assumption is, from the deflation transitory camp is, once you get rid of all tenants, you're going to have a lot of supply in the market and rent prices will go down. False. And the reason is, landlords are jacking up prices insanely higher for new leases. They get rid of the old tenant and they're not renting the same property for the same price. They're jacking up prices significantly higher, above 10%. So if anything, the eviction crisis will shoot up rent prices higher, not down. In some small cities in the United States of America, we're not talking about villages here. We're talking about smaller cities. The number of vacant units is less than 500. We're talking about cities like Bakersfield, Eugene, Oregon, Santa Barbara, Salem, Oregon. These are not tiny villages. These are small cities. And many of these cities have less than 500 units available. The headline from USA Today says, Renting an apartment, question mark, rents during COVID are already high and they are only going higher. Families cannot afford a home. They have to settle down for a rental unit and they're paying an arm and a leg for a garbage rental unit. Take, for example, the so-called most affordable city in America, Las Vegas. This is America's most affordable housing market. Las Vegas rents rising at escalating speed, way out of whack. And now, of course, we have the Supreme Court reversing the Biden, Biden administration's decision to extend the evictions moratorium. And right away, we have news that at least 750,000 families will get evicted from their homes by the end of the year, perhaps creating one of the biggest homelessness crises, one of the biggest homelessness waves 
that this country has ever seen. Of course, some states, the likes of California, for example, we have our own evictions moratorium, which will expire by the end of September. So sooner or later, we're going to see millions of evictions being processed. And of course, you might ask, where is the rental assistance program from the federal government? Here's the answer. Only a fraction of COVID-19 rental assistance has been distributed. Just 4.7 billion of almost 47 billion appropriated by the Congress had reached tenants and landlords through July. My question is, where is the rest of the money? We know that plenty of scams stole billions and billions and billions of dollars in the PPI program. Now we have another cookie jar from the government and somebody sticking their hands inside the cookie jar and stealing. If 4.7 billion were processed out of 47 billion, then where is the rest of the 42 billion almost? 42 billion. Where did that money go? And as you might be aware, corporate America, the likes of BlackRock, Blackstone are scooping up single family homes across the country, further dragging down the affordability for average American households. Buying a home, even renting a home, is becoming out of reach, unaffordable for the majority of Americans. Why are corporations and shell companies over at the Cayman Islands scooping up single family homes across the country? Why is that allowed? Why are the rich using the funny money printed out of thin air by the Fed, which magically lands at the pockets of Wall Street and the 1%? Why are they using all of that money to scoop up properties across the country, stifling American households from the opportunity of owning a home? And now they're coming after the rental market too. They want to be your landlord. They want to be the last resort of lending. They want to be the last resort for food. They're scooping up farms across the country and now they're scooping up properties across the country because they want to be your landlord you have no choice but to submit to the ruling class in this country and by the way have they made their wealth by working hard by innovating by producing something by creating jobs of course not they made their wealth sitting on their asses digitally by the fed pumping billions and billions and billions of dollars every single month to prop up the assets of the wealthy stocks and real estate the rich use that funny money to scoop up and own the entire nation from homes to land to farms when is it gonna end when do we wake up combine all of that by the way with the supply chain bottlenecks the crisis in the supply chain and now you have the perfect storm to create a historic inflation slash stagflation crisis the world has never seen since the 1970s shipping container costs are rising in a stunning fashion last year it was 3500 bucks a piece this is la to china by the way or for, excuse me from china to la long beach the cost right now for a shipping container is eight Eighteen thousand and five hundred dollars but the fed says hey, hey, hey where is inflation it's transitory folks rest assured it's gonna be transitory don't panic don't scream continue to stay in the casino put your blindfold on and continue to think that this will last forever that this will not morph into a massive economic crisis when we talk about logistics the crisis doesn't stop in shipping once goods land at ports we have another dilemma to deal with which is the shortage of truck drivers the CEO of U.S. Express says the truck driver shortage is about as bad as I have ever seen. And now, of course, they're recruiting women to solve the shortage in truckers. Now, I can tell you as a former trucker myself, I used to drive a truck for a living. It's a miserable job. It pays a lot, but there is a catch, a big one. The lifestyle is awful. Between the drugs, the ambient, the gambling, the hookers, you have truckers who don't see their families for weeks and weeks. It is absolutely draining. And sure, we thank vets, we thank policemen, police women, firefighters, but we should also thank truckers because they do the miserable job. And without them, this entire economy will come down to a screeching halt. Forget about picking up trash either. We're having a shortage because nobody wants to pick up trash. This is the shortage of labor. And of course, they say, wait till the enhanced unemployment benefits expire in September. The labor shortage will be resolved. Wait and see. It will not be resolved. The demeanor from workers and employees has changed forever. COVID-19, the stay-at-home environment, changed our attitudes toward work forever you got to remember this this country the united states of america has the most overworked 
and underpaid workers in the Western world combine the reckless policy out of central banks with the supply chain shortages, the supply chain bottlenecks. On top of that, add the COVID crisis slowing down the distribution. And again, we have the perfect storm. And I think that the Fed is underestimating the threat of this inflation slash stagflation storm. A COVID outbreak that temporarily shut down a warehouse for one of the largest wholesale food distributors in the United States, leading to food shortages even after the facility reopened. Again, Powell says all of this is transitory, but even after we shut down and we reopen again, it takes a lot of time to normalize and catch up with the demand. They say, oh, the chip shortage will be resolved by next year. Watch how long will this one take. It will take way longer than any experts, quote unquote, experts expected. And this is, of course, impacting car production. Car production in the United Kingdom plummeted to levels last seen 65 years ago. Matter of fact, car inventories hitting all time lows. We talk about the rise in used cars prices and even new cars prices. The reason is we're at the lowest level of inventory ever. And here's yet another twist in this inflation crisis, the hoarding from China. And this is regarding the quote unquote everything metal, aluminum. Now you understand that we have a shortage in labor in aluminum mining. And on top of that, we have a crisis when it comes to the supply chain, whether it is from trucking all the way to shipping via ports. On top of that, we have a race between nations to accumulate aluminum. Aluminum, aluminum goes in everything, including EV production, by the way. Aluminum buyers in the United States and Europe are struggling to get their hands on the metal, thanks to container shortages and shipping delays. Of course, China is also hoarding aluminum, and this is leaving US and European buyers struggling to get their hands on aluminum. All of this dynamic is contributing to raise and push aluminum prices significantly higher. So when we talk about the stocks that you should invest in in this environment, you have to think about the source. You have to think about these bullet stocks that will benefit regardless. And some of these stocks are in the steel, aluminum, copper. All of these are good stocks to be in because the demand will still be here. There is a massive shortage here. And the moment we move out of the pandemic, the demand will skyrocket again. Meanwhile, it will take a long time for the supply to resume. Zoom. And here it is when we talk about labor shortages and the changes in attitude. The Fed and their allies, the deflation, the transitory camps, they point out to deflationary forces that has been going on in the economy for decades and decades, including China. China has been a source of deflation due to cheap labor, but now the picture is changing within China. China is becoming an inflation force. Labor shortages are materializing across China as young people shun factory jobs and more migrant workers stay home. You can read the article on your own, but I'm just going to give you a snippet here. He said the factory cannot afford to boost salaries in large part because of higher raw material prices this year. The other option would be to increase prices for overseas buyers if they accept them. This is from a Chinese factory, of course. And this is a Chinese worker explaining to you the changes in attitudes. Unlike our generation, young people's attitudes toward work have changed. They can fall back on their parents and don't have much pressure to make ends meet. On top of that, a lot of them did not come to the factory to work, but to look for boyfriends and girlfriends. Wow. China's shortfall in factory labor comes as it grapples with the opposite problem in another part of its economy. Too many workers for white-collar professional jobs. More than 9 million students, a record, are graduating from college this year. Aggravating the structural mismatch in China's labor market, economists say. So there goes your deflation source. The world is still short of everything get used to it. Pandemic-related product shortages from computer chips to construction materials were supposed to be resolved by now. You hear that, Mr. Powell? Instead, the world has gained a lesson in the ripple effects of disruption. Oh, we didn't see that one coming. Nobody was warning about, uh, nobody was warning us about this. Yeah, right. And here it is, folks. This is another piece of information that we got in the morning today. U.S. consumer confidence dropped in August to a six-month low on concerns over the Delta variant. Of course, 
the devil is always in the details. Bloomberg and the likes are pinning the drop in consumer confidence to the rise of Delta. But when you read the report, a massive part in the drop in consumer confidence is due to inflation and increasing prices. Ta-da! Prices are rising across the board from car and truck rentals to used cars to gasoline, beef, energy, poultry, fruits, pork, Jewelry, fish, haircuts, TVs, electricity, everything is rising higher. And what's going down in price, by the way? Men's suits. At least when you're homeless, you can wear a suit and a tie. You look nice. You might get a job. You see, there is there is a benefit to all of this. And by the way, this inflation crisis is not just an American phenomenon. It is becoming a global phenomenon. Home prices in the United Kingdom rose at the fastest pace since 2004 add a whack and of course the assumption is this is outpricing the majority of the poor and middle class in the united kingdom in britain the national health service recently advised that it must delay some blood tests because of a shortage of needed gear a recent survey by the confederation of british industry found the worst shortages of parts in the history of the index which started in 1977 but is the bank of england or the ecb paying attention at all no their job their mandate is to continue to print print baby print because their mandate is to continue to inflate, preserve, and protect the assets of the wealthy, stocks, and real estate. The great supply chain disruption is a central element of the extraordinary uncertainty that continues to frame economic prospects worldwide. If the shortages persist well into next year, that could advance rising prices on a range of commodities, as central banks from the United States to Australia debate the appropriate level of concern about inflation. They're still thinking about it, folks. They must consider a question none can answer with full confidence. Are the shortages and delays merely temporary mishaps accompanying the resumption of business or something more insidious that could last well into next year? And while they think about the answer, inflation continues to skyrocket at a whack across the globe. German inflation jumps to its highest level in a quarter of a century. But hey, this is gonna be transitory. No big deal, folks. Rest assured, trust us. Spanish inflation rises at the fastest pace since 2012. And the inflation crisis over at Brazil is now exceeding 9%, well above the 3.75 bullshit target from the Brazilian Central Bank. And the question is, how come the heads of central banks across the globe missing out on all of this data? How are they continuing to convince themselves that this is a transitory crisis when the data and the facts show otherwise? The reason is, it is their mandate. They have no choice. They have to continue in this charade, in this scam, in this Ponzi scheme for as long as possible. Because the other choice would be tapering and raising interest rates, aka monetary tightening. Doing so in a zombified global economy, drowned in debt, will blow up the entire world. Economies across the globe will come down crashing in an instant. So they have to cross their fingers and pray that inflation will be transitory. And if it's not, they're going to move to step number two, which is cooking the data, engineering inflation expectations, meaning the next jobs reports, the next CPI reports will be cooked to show that the pace of inflation is waning down when the facts on the ground say otherwise. And by the way, what are our choices here? We have Jerome Powell, the zombie heading the Federal Reserve right now. The alternative is brain dead. And brain dead is even worse than Powell. And here are the betting odds. For now, Powell is the favorite. The likelihood is that Biden will extend the tenure of Powell, the tyrannic dictatorship of Powell. But who is the alternative here? Brain dead, boy stick, they're all coming from the same cabal. We're out of hope here, folks. And with that positive note, let's move on to cover the market's performance today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red, down 39.11 points or a decline of 0.11%. The Nasdaq down 6.65 points or a decline of 0.04%. The S&P 500 also down 6.11 points or a decline of 0.13%. Pretty much flat and the reason is we did not see a move in the Dixie or the 10-year yield and therefore the algos are confused today. 
What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal consumer cyclicals at number two for the silver reits and at number three for the bronze communication services meanwhile the laggards of the day led by materials technology and energy interesting you have the inflationary trade of materials and energy lagging along with the deflationary trade of technology what about the advanced to decline ratio in the market today nyse 54 percent advancing versus 43 percent declining the nasdaq 62 percent advancing versus 34% declining. Futures, what's going on here? The dollar did not move one way or the other. Yields, slightly higher, but not by much. And therefore, we're seeing this profit taking in the futures market. Crude oil down, whether we're talking about the WTI or Brent. Brent, of course, suffering the bulk of the declines by over 2.5% today. Meanwhile, gasoline prices slightly down today after the storm in Louisiana. Likewise, in uh, softs, we have declines across the board, with exception of lumber closing at the flat line what about metals pretty much muted action across the board with noticeable gains for platinum when it comes to meats down across the board leading the declines lean hogs futures likewise in grains pretty much down across the board with some flat activities in wheat rough rice and canola in addition to soybean meal futures but we have losses here for soybeans soybean oil corn and oats futures the decline of the u.s dollar perhaps was good for the kiwis because the restrictions over in new zealand are being slowly eased and therefore the kiwis are rising higher today What about the big casino, the options market? What's going on here? The hottest table by far, per usual, is Apple, with about 900,000 contracts, about 66.5% of those were calls. At number two remains a hot name here, the ticker BBRG Vinco Ventures. This is the newest meme stock traded via the Wall Street Bets crowd, allegedly, of course. And the volume today was about 560,000 contracts exchanging hands about 89 percent of those were calls of course they continue to say that these are kids trading and all of that but i'll show you that these are not kids these are professionals creating these schemes but at number three we have amc with about 475,000 contracts about 74 percent of those were calls and here it is folks the unusual trades that took place in the options market today, starting with, you guessed it, BBIG, Vinco Ventures. The name traded down double digits in the morning, but we saw a comeback, an epic one, as the buying accelerated midday. This trade was an important one because it was the catalyst behind the pop in this name and the reversal midday they bought the 10 bucks calls, expiration date September 17th, with expectations that the name will rise higher by over 23% by then. They paid about one buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $7 million on this trade alone. Now, they continue to say that these are kids kids over at Reddit trading the stock and popping it higher. Perhaps kids in their 50s because we're talking about $7 million here. We're talking about monthly expiration. This stock doesn't have weekly expiration. The retail crowd always looks for weekly expiration because these are cheap options with the potential of higher reward. This is monthly expiration, which tells me that the, these are professionals, folks. The, these are hedgies, institutionals, and the likes invading Wall Street bets, the chat rooms, and popping these stocks higher. Here's another one, the ticker ELYS for Illies, Eli's, whatever the hell it is, K Game Tech. Do you even care what the company is? Let's be honest here. Somebody spits the ticker over at TikTok, you take it, you buy call options randomly, and boom, you're done. Of course, if you're an idiot, you're gonna buy the stock and hoodle, hodl till the moon. This is the future, bro. The shorty's about to get squeezed. Yada yada yada. Again, understand that these are trades. You get in, you make a quick buck and you get out. Anyhow, they're betting for more gains in this name, which, which popped higher significantly so today. By buying these seven and a half calls, expiration date September 17th, again, monthly expiration, with expectations that the name will rise higher by over 13% by then. They paid about 90 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1.2 million. What about the trade for the ticker P? 
YPL, PayPal. Of course, we have the rumors of uh, the trading platform from PayPal, etc., etc. Now they're betting that this is a catalyst for PayPal stock to surge higher. They bought the 310 calls, expiration date September 10th. With expectations that the name will rise higher by over 7% by then, and they paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $440,000. What about the trade for the ticker PLCE? Children Place. They bought the 75 puts. This is a bearish one. The expiration date of September 17th. With expectations that the name will drop down by more than 14% by then. Oh, and they paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about half a million dollars what about the ticker vtr for ventures whatever that is another stock not in the meme stock by the way but they're betting for declines to come for this name by buying the 52 and a half puts expiration date october 15th with expectations that the name will drop down by more than six percent by then they paid about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about four hundred thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker b i double l for bill.com they're betting for gains here and they're spending big bucks for this one they're buying the 290 calls with the expiration date of october 15th with the expectations that the name will surge higher by over six percent by then they paid about 13 bucks a piece 13 bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 5.2 million dollars lastly what about the trade for the ticker amc for you guessed it amc they bought the 44 puts interesting they're betting for declines here by the end of the week for this name amc surged higher today but this bet is calling a top at least for this week they bought the 44 puts expiration date this upcoming Friday, September 3rd. With expectations that the name will drop down by over 7% by then, they paid about a buck and 15 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $400,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis. There's nothing to see here. The dollar was flat, yields slightly higher. So we're seeing moves based on the options market activities. The pumps don't last via options. Quick profit taking when you're seeing names like Apple, for example, that was pumped higher yesterday. Now it is trading down at least today for about 1% losses. We're seeing a bounce in the Chinese names, Alibaba, JD, Pindudu. The problem is, are these rebounds sustainable at all we've seen them before they last for a day or two a week or so and then we see more news or we get more news from china regarding more restrictions and these names get sold off again for now there is nothing to see in this map at all there is no theme there is no guideline to extract from the action we saw in the market today let's move on to charts see what's going on here starting with the 30 minutes chart of the SPY. We talked about the RSI trading at the sell zone. So we were expecting a pullback to begin with. We got the pullback, a small one, not a big one. And for now, the SPY is pretty much trading within a bull flag formation with the expectations that the SPY will continue to surge higher. In case we have more downside to come here, I'm looking at the gap. This will be destination number one. And then destination number two will be the second gap which coincides with the support line of 447. Here is a daily chart for the continuous contract on the SPY, the S&P 500. The momentum indicators are moving higher in positive territory, indicating that the SPY has momentum behind it. But we continue to track the divergence on the trend line. If this is, if this is just a garden variety divergence from the trend line that will be followed by a correction all the way to visit the trend line, then we're pretty much stopping here because the average is about three and a half percent we're already diverging by a little over 3.6 percent on the other hand if we have a last hurrah rally then the divergence will exceed five percent so we have a little more room to go here in the spy and this is exactly what i'm tracking right now I want to see if this is just a normal divergence per usual that will be followed by a revisit to the trend line or is this the last hurrah rally and the outcome will be breaking the trend once and for all. Moving on to the cues, the Nasdaq 30 minutes chart. Again, we have a small pullback and this was expected because the RSI was trading in the sell zone. We went down for a little bit but the cues managed to rebound higher. 
Now, we have a mini, baby, insignificant bear flag formation. If it plays out, then we have the gap highlighted in the yellow bubble. That will be destination number one. And then we have destination number two, the 372 support line. This will be a strong support. So the Qs has a, a lot of support behind it here. Moving on to a daily chart for the continuous contract on the NASDAQ. The momentum indicator indicators are surging higher, whether it is the RSI or the MACD indicator. Likewise, the candlesticks are trading way above 15,000. And the question is, how far is the divergence from the trend line? For that, we move on to the chart of the NDX daily chart. We have a variation here in divergence all the way from 11 and a half to 15 to 10 percent this is a normal divergence from the trend line yes it has prolonged the last time we had a correction was back in may we haven't had a correction and a revisit to the trend line since then if this is a garden variety move within a trend line then we should expect to pull back anytime soon here and it will be a steep one, by the way, all the way down to the trend line. If this is the last hurrah rally, as we've seen back in August of last year, then we should expect the queues to rally and diverge above the trend line by the tune of over 15%. So plenty of room to go here if the market wants to go crazy. What about the IWM 30 minutes chart? Nothing changed here. The support remains 223, the resistance at 229. It will all depend on the outcome of the reopening trade. One day they're up, the airlines, the casinos, the cruises, the other day they're down. There is no consistency here and therefore the IWM is struggling for direction. Of course, another component of the IWM, the Russell 2000, is all of these meme stocks when they surge higher they act as a buffer for the declines in the reopening trade but what if the reopening trade along with meme stocks come down crashing together for now we're watching the range support 223 resistance 229 what about the dixie what's going on here flat day for the dixie it was down big in the morning but we started to hear hawkish comments out of the ES ECB, the European Central Bank. As the comments started to circulate, the dollar index rose to session high. Meanwhile, yields also continued to climb a little higher. The tapering scenario, the real one, will push the US dollar higher and yields higher which is, if you remember, the worst case scenario for the market. Both the transitory, excuse me, transitory, the inflationary and the disinflationary trade will suffer alike. Because when yields and the dollar go higher, we have pressure on commodities and on the growth momentum trade. What's going on with gold? The Dixie yields not moving one way or the other, pretty much flat, and therefore gold also trading flat, waiting and waiting and waiting for a definitive move and a guideline out of the Dixie and yields. This guideline will uh, come out perhaps after the non-farm payroll report, which we're about to receive this Friday. What about yields? We talked about the retest of 1.28%. Was the retest successful? We will find out as soon as tonight, by the way, if you're watching uh, futures or the confirmation, the real one will happen as we start trading in the US market tomorrow. If yields continue to move higher, then the retest of 1.28 percent is done and we have higher highs from this point on tlt weekly chart not looking good here for the weekly candle at least for now we have three more days to go we're watching 149 the chart has been consolidating around that number over and over and over again this we this is the equivalent of 1.28 percent on the yields chart one of these charts Yields or the TLT will break out one way or the other. The assumption is if the retest of 1.28% in the 10-year yield is successful, that we have higher highs in yields. What does that mean? It means the TLT will fail to pop higher above 149. This is what I'm watching for all the way to the end of the week. Apple, what's going on here? 30 minutes chart, we have a breakout above 150. But again, it was trading at the sell zone from an RSI perspective, and therefore we have a pullback. Remember that the pump in Apple happened via options. Therefore, the sustainability of the pop is under question. The threshold to watch for is 150. If the chart moves down, breaking the support of 150, then we have an ominous signal. Not just for Apple, by the way, but for the entirety of the market that the market is running out of fuel and it doesn't have what it takes to move higher tesla what's going on here moving a little higher today we saw a little bit of a pump and dump shall we say a pump in the morning a dump by the end of the day but all in all it was a green day 
for Tesla. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for the lower or excuse me, the higher low, because we have a series of higher highs and higher lows. Will the next higher low come above 720? This will be extremely bullish for the stock. Or will it come below 720? If that is the case, then the likelihood is the trend is weakening and the next low will be a lower low. Before I forget, let's revisit the VIX from a four hours perspective. It looks, when you look at the MACD, every time we have a crossing creating green impressions in the histogram, we have a double digit pop minimum in the VIX. It looks as if the VIX is attempting to pop higher looking at the MACD indicator. If that happens, will the VIX close the week above 20? If that is the case, then we don't have our last hurrah rally in the SPY or the NASDAQ for that matter. But if the VIX continues to flush down and the target becomes closing the gap at 15 rather than closing the week above 20, then we're going to have the last hurrah scenario in the market. Tulips, what's going on here? BTC, not looking good here. It is still a bullish consolidation, but there are signs for weakening in the MACD and the RSI indicators. Furthermore, you have the psychology. If these meme stocks continue to surge higher, 20, 30% per day, then Tulip holds will find the grass greener on the other side taking profits from BTC and migrating to meme land and this will be bad for the tulip market but you know which tulip is at performing right now it is ETH Ethereum which is my favorite tulip by the way I trade this one from time to time we have a breakout here and now ETH is reaching the Fibonacci retracement level of resistance right now. If it pops higher, then all-time highs will be the next target. So watch out for ETH, a potential for breakout higher to revisit all time highs lastly what about amc we talked about a lower high here perhaps breaking the bullish trend we're still waiting and waiting and waiting for the pullback the real one in amc and how high will this high be will it be a double top this will be ominous will it be a lower high that's also a bad signal or will it be a higher high perhaps all the way breaking the resistance of 52 this will be the ultimate bullish scenario for amc because breaking above 52 the resistance resistance level will add a buffer so you don't have to worry about 32 anymore from a weekly perspective or from a daily chart perspective you have a buffer you have support at 52 because remember the threshold the big number is 32 breaking 32 from a weekly perspective it's over so closing the week above 52 should be the target for the ape community to aim for moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have in the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the ADP report, which will be important as an appetizer for the big one on Friday, the non-farm payroll report. Now, in the last few months, we have noticed the divergence between the ADP and the non-farm payroll report. One month, the ADP comes out hot, but the non-farm payroll, payroll report from the BLS comes out cool. And then last month, the ADP was down down big to an alarming level by the way but somehow the bls non-farm payroll report came out hot so will the adp this time around offer any valuable insight regarding the upcoming non-farm payroll report who knows a lot of cooking is being done here then we have the manufacturing pmi and the ism manufacturing index this will be important to build on the chicago pmi that we got today lastly we have construction spending and motor vehicle sales. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.